You're listening to the Read Aloud Revival. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. This is episode one. I'm Sarah McKenzie, and I'm really glad you're here. I look forward to connecting with you here in this new format, and I'm super excited to inspire you to make reading aloud a bigger, more central part of your family life. I've got some awesome guests in the lineup for the next few months, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm really glad you're here right at the start of it. A little backstory for those of you who might not know, I started the Read Aloud Revival as a series of posts I ran on my blog amongst lovelythings.com. We talked about strategies to help us read aloud, things like how to keep toddlers busy, how to choose books for boys, how to find excellent audiobooks, and how to get motivated to read aloud when you've fallen out of the habit. It was really fun, and we had some fabulous discussions in the comments there, but I really felt like we could make more headway by chatting about this as a podcast and bringing in some of the people who inspire and encourage us most when it comes to reading aloud to our kids. So here we are. That's what we are doing today. And every few weeks, I'll have a new episode for you. I've already got the first few months lined up, and I can tell you one thing for sure. The spring and summer will be loaded with great inspiration. So make sure you subscribe to this podcast so that you don't miss any of it. You can subscribe directly to the podcast in iTunes or head to readaloudrevival.com to pop your email into the form there, and I'll send you a heads up every time a new episode is up. Today, I have the honor of chatting with Andrew Pudua from the Institute for Excellence in Writing. Andrew has been hugely influential in my own understanding of the importance of reading aloud. He gives a talk, Nurturing Competent Communicators, that just really lit a fire under me and helped me grow my desire to read aloud more to my kids. You know, I'd always read aloud to my young kids, my three and four-year-olds, just like I think most of us do. But Andrew challenged me with the idea that older children, those who can read aloud to themselves, need to be read aloud to even more than young children do. And that is what we're going to chat about today. So we'll get right to it after this quick message from our sponsor. Once upon a time, do your children love those words? Then join us each week at Sparkle Stories. Our stories are simple, delightful, and filled with a sense of wonder. They'll inspire children to play, to marvel, to laugh, and to be kind. How to enjoy Sparkle Stories? Well, you can subscribe to any of our eight original story series and hear new stories each Friday. Or try one of our many audiobooks. And each week... We share a free story on the Sparkle iTunes podcast. You'll find us at www.sparklestories.com. Enjoy! Hi, Andrew. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for being with, uh, chatting with me today. I know it's a super busy time of year for you with conferences all over the country and a packed travel schedule, so I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me today. Oh, it's a joy to do so. Well, tell us just a little bit about your family and the Institute for Excellence in Writing so that our listeners get a bit of an idea of who you are and what you do. You all have uh, seven children. Um, Five are grown. The other two think they're grown, uh, but they're (laughs) still at home, uh, 17, 14. I have uh, five grandchildren, so I'm moving very rapidly into being the uh, very experienced grandpa. (laughs) <laughs> um, we uh, live out here in eastern Oklahoma, a very rural location where we uh, came five years ago from California and built a nice big uh, office warehouse uh, on our property. And we have uh, Institute for Excellence in Writing where we uh, coordinate uh, my speaking and, and online classes. And then, of course, mostly we're known for our video courses on helping um, Parents and teachers help children learn English composition with a system of structure and style. And uh, we keep um, adding little new products and services and and growing over the years and uh, primarily servicing the homeschool market. And it's been a a great ride. Very good. Yes, your work with the Institute for Excellence in Writing and um, your speaking has been a big inspiration to me. So, Thank you. Well, you have a huge heart for reading aloud, and that seems to be a message that you want to get far and wide. So 
the first time I heard your talk, Nurturing Competent Communicators, gosh, that must have been sometime around three or four years ago. And it has been instrumental for me in understanding the importance of reading aloud and in helping me make it a huge priority in our family life. So can you tell me what inspired you to record that talk and to give that talk and what you're hoping to accomplish with that message? Um, yeah, I am. Um I was uh, uh, noting that, you know, some people just have kind of a natural ability to kind of learn our system and do it, and it works very well, you know, all the structural models, stylistic techniques. And other people, you know, they can learn the same thing and do it, but they just don't have the same level of, of smoothness, refinement, sophistication, and language, vocabulary. So I kind of started wondering you know, I work mostly on the output side. How do you get good quality English out of people's brains? And I thought, maybe my problem here with these folks that seem to not just get it is that they don't have a good database of language in their brain to begin with. So, right. so I started to think, you know, where do people, children in particular, because that's who we teach, you know, where do children get their language from on a daily basis, you know, like the average kid in the average situation, where does, what's the number one influence on their language? And uh, I, I came up with this kind of line of thought that was a little bit disturbing to me because statistically, now this is probably not true for most homeschooling families, but statistically, children watch 25 hours of television a week. Wow. Um, and that's just huge. And of course, you know, that's a, that's a huge influence on their language. And you would ask the question, does television provide for children a source of reliably correct and sophisticated vocabulary and syntax? Yeah, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, that's, you know, that's a handicap for a lot of kids. That's a huge amount of time. Uh, but it's not the only influence. What's number two? And again, I thought, you know, the average student in the average situation, who goes to a school with age-segregated classrooms and then plays with children the same age, you know, after school and goes to sports and extracurricular activities with children the same age. Our whole society is kind of geared towards even Sunday schools. We divide children into age-based groups. Right. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, do peers provide a source of reliably correct and sophisticated English? For each other? No. No. Right. If anything, they sink down to the lowest common denominator of language, and you'll actually see kids intentionally kind of dumb themselves down so they don't look out of place or too smart so they can fit in and be cool. Yes, I've seen that. <clears throat> so really, linguistically, the worst possible environment you create could create would be 26 nine-year-olds in one room together all day. Um, now, again, we in the homeschool, we, you know, we tend to to realize that, you know, good socialization actually occurs when children are with a wider range of children and, and adults, younger and older than they are. Um, but, but you know, I, I was working, you know, a bit with kids in, in public schools and, and in Christian schools, and I'm thinking, wow, the top two influences on their language are both actually negative. They're not elevating the language. They're probably pulling it down. Hmm. So I thought, okay, let's keep going here. What's number three? And, and I realized, you know, for most families, probably parents and by extension, other busy adults. So you could say, um, you know, how's the family going? You know, to what degree are we able to sit and have long, meaningful, in-depth conversations with our children. And I realized, you know, even though I'm homeschooling, I am blasted busy all the time, you know. And right. a lot of what I say to my children are, you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, do your math or you're not going to eat lunch ever, you know, or, <laughs> or uh, hey, you know, you're doing a great job. Keep going with that. I got to go over and do something really important and then I'll come back. And I also uh, go into a bit of detail. I think all of us can relate to how electricity and and modern technology just pulls people in different directions and oh yeah you know even if they're in the same room we can all be in the same room but everybody's attending to their own little screen it, or whatever yeah and, exactly and so I, I thought you know that's that's so different than way it was you know even fifty years ago that was through televisions and phones but 
you know, televisions were controllable and phones were on cords attached to walls. You know, now everybody's <laughs> got their own phone and there's computers everywhere and you can go everywhere and do anything you want. So I'm I'm seeing even in my own family how hard it is. And and so I got to this conclusion that the the most significant source of high quality language coming into children's brains is not going to come from media, from schools, from peers, or from, even from families. It's got to come from reading out loud to children in huge quantity, which was the main source, pretty much the only source of entertainment that existed before electricity. Right. You know, and you think about the mid, you think about the mid 1800s. If you ever read these letters from, say, Civil War soldiers, the, mm-hmm. the prose is just magnificent. It's it's language that n- would put all of us to shame in terms of its poetic quality and beauty. And yet that was common for people to be able to speak and write so eloquently. And I think it's because the culture for you know so long, for hu- many, many generations, particularly in the white population in North America, was to you know, sit in one room with, you know, from great grandma to the baby on the floor and read to each other and read the great literature and the scriptures and talk. And, you know, this whole, this whole very literate culture was primarily developed in the home through reading out loud. And when I realized that, I thought this is the real problem with the increasingly, not even illiterate, just a literate society. Not people who can't read, people who just don't read in this country. Right. And of course, right. the schools are desperate. You know, they're just, the, the teachers in schools are just, oh, if children would just read, 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 read. If children would just read, then, you know, then all our problems would be solved. Of course, it's they're like the Holy of, Grail or something. It, right. It, it, well, it's the new god of education. It's become an idol. Yeah. You know, if everybody just read, then they could take standardized tests and we'd all look better. <laughs> You know, if they, can't, if they can't read, they, we can't test them, and everything falls apart. That's right. So um, I just kind of got on this this track of thinking and wanted to, you know, kind of demonstrate to parents, you know, in a more complete way than I just went through with you, that, you know, this is the world we live in, and if we're going to recover, you know, individual, family, just cultural, social literacy, it's got to happen with reading aloud. And I just love your the little paper. It's it's got the books and says read aloud revival. That's what <laughs> I want is this revival where we believe again in what's important and then we do what we believe. Well, there definitely I think seems to be a, a pretty common misconception that it's more valuable for children to read to themselves, you know, than it is for them to be read to. And I think a lot of people don't even consider listening to audiobooks. Maybe they haven't considered doing it at all, but if they have considered it, they don't really consider that or stories that are read aloud to children as actual reading. You know, they value, we value, we tend to value reading to yourself, a child reading to himself as a uh, more important activity well, than reading aloud. So, yeah, can you speak to that a absolutely. bit? Absolutely. That, that's part of the brainwashing that the public school institutions do on everybody around them. I've actually heard of teachers who've said to parents, don't read out loud to your children. They need to read on their own. Oh, wow. But here's what I've discovered, is that it's actually the age at which children start to read on their own more. And that, you know, that can happen at five or six. It can happen at 13 or 14. You know, I know some men who didn't read a book till they were in their late teens. So you can never predict, you know, an age-based standard for when children start to read more on their own. But I would argue this, Sarah. It's the age at which children start to read independently more that they most should be read to They most need to be read to at a level above their own decoding skills. I'm I'm glad you said that because I wanted to ask you specifically about that. I've heard you say that before. So can you tell us why that is? Well, there's a couple of things that can happen. Um, One thing that can happen with children who like to read and read a lot is they'll start to read fast. They'll read books like they watch movies very, very fast. They want to get the plot. They want to get the action. And so... They'll do what you or I do when we read fast. They'll just skip stuff. 
you know, <laughs> see a word, don't know what it is, skip it. See an idiom or an expression or a figure of speech that you're not familiar with, just skip it. I mean, mm-hmm. e- let's face it, you can skip huge chunks of talking and still <laughs> get the story. Yeah. Right. And so kids, especially because they're so used to very, very fast paced juvenile literature that are driven by very, very fast paced movies, people don't have the tolerance for a 90 second view of the landscape with a soundtrack on the background like movies used to have 50 years ago. If it doesn't have instant action they won't pay attention to it. They'll say this is boring. Same thing with the juvenile literature. If it doesn't hook them you know, from the first page, they're just going to say it's boring. I don't want to read it. Mm-hmm. And so they won't. Uh, so the, the, the literature is written to be sped through, uh, whereas great literature actually is written to be savored. The language, the descriptions, the, the depth of... of insight that comes through a great book. So uh, one reason we need to read to kids who read a lot is because they will skip stuff and they won't actually build the syntax, the complete sentence patterns. They won't stretch their vocabulary. They'll just read it for fun and we think that's great, but they're missing out. Uh, And the second thing is they won't read things that are not immediately interesting to them. Um, And so in order to build their appreciation for the better literature, if we read out loud to them at a level above their own decoding skills, two things happen. Number one, we read every word, right? We don't skip stuff. Uh, Second of all, we can talk about it. We can explain things. We can help them understand the illusions. If there are historical elements, we can discover, oh, who was that person? Where was that place? We actually can build comprehension by reading out loud and talking about stuff. And and so for even for kids who read a lot on their own, even at a young age, doing that is what's going to pull up their comprehension. Yeah, one of the things I really appreciate when we read aloud as a family, in our family, is that not only does it pull up the comprehension, but I feel like it builds kind of a family culture because we're all sharing stories and ideas and um, it gives us something else to talk about that's bigger than ourselves or bigger than the, the you know, small world kind of daily grind that we are inhabiting every day. Oh. And so it builds this beautiful family culture. So true, so true. And then, you know, something will happen in the home, and then one of the kids will say, oh, well, that's like when that character did this thing, and they start to make these connections and comparisons, and that's when the literature becomes even more meaningful to them, because they they see the parallels and the similarities between literature and life. Right. And, and the point you made about kids skipping stuff. And I skip stuff when I read too. I have my oldest daughter is 12 and she is a voracious reader and she reads at a very high level. Uh, And yet (laughs) um, I know that she, I know that she skips stuff. And you have a phrase that you've talked about, or you've, you've mentioned before when you've talked about this, about the reliably correct, what is it? Reliably correct and sophisticated language patterns. Yes. Yes. So I know that when she's reading to herself, she isn't getting those language patterns into her brain. And I know you've said before, if you don't get it into their brain, then you can't really expect them to have reliably correct and sophisticated language patterns coming out in their writing. So how does this whole um, reading aloud, how does that tie in really specifically with a a child's ability to write, to learn to be a good communicator? Well, uh, for one, um, they are hearing language. And if you read even half decently, they're hearing complex ideas being articulated with the correct nuances. So when you have a a compound sentence or even a compound sentence with multiple clauses, Mm -hmm. when you try to decode that on paper, um, it's a little bit hard to follow. You know, where's the main clause? Where's the subject? What's what's going on here? Um, Unless you can hear it. Because when you hear it, then the, the, the natural speaking style of humans is to emphasize certain things and de-emphasize certain others and to pause in certain places and to uh, give language its 
its depth and life. It's, it's, uh, I mean, let's face it. Language is first and foremost a verbal auditory function. Right. Listening and speaking are prerequisite to reading and writing. If you cannot listen well, it's going to be hard to read complicated things. If you cannot speak well or at least form complicated language ideas in your in your mind, you're not going to be able to write that. And so having those first two of the language arts, listening and speaking, uh, under good development, then the reading and the writing is so much easier. But the problem is society, and schools in particular, they can't really test, they can't really assess the listening and speaking, so they jump over to let's teach reading and writing because we can assess these things. And yet the, right. the latter two are predicated on competence with the former two. Yeah, right. right. And we can recover that at home. Yeah, I also uh, notice that... Um, Adults, uh, you know, I'll often I'll be at a conference or something, and you know, somebody will come up to me and we'll be chatting, and and an adult will say, you know, I I'm a pretty good writer, at least I think so. I mean, I always got good grades on my papers in college, and you know, I I feel like I know what I'm doing, but I don't remember ever learning how to do it. Right? It was just kind of mm-hmm. a natural thing that happened. I will ask them. I will say, did your parents read out loud to you a lot as you were growing up? And eight times out of ten, they'll say, yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, my father read the Reader's Digest every day after dinner. How would you know wow. that, you know? <laughs> and, and the two times out of ten, when they say, no, my parents didn't read out loud to us, but I was the oldest in my family, and I used to read to my younger siblings a lot, you know. Because, oh, interesting. Because okay. when you read it out loud, you're kind of forced to read every word with the better expression, the nuance, the phrasing that builds the language database so well. Right, right. It slows you down. I know that when I, if I'm going to read something out loud to my kids, it, it slows us down considerably, but it's so enjoyable. It's so much more enjoyable than when I speak through it, even reading it myself. I, I have that natural tendency to skip over the really descriptive passages or those things that are really poetic if you stop and read them out loud and really help you to see what's beautiful and appreciate the art that is the literature that's a whole a whole different ball game so yeah and i'm i'm actually reading a book right now called how to read slowly oh i don't think i've seen that one who wrote that um sire s-a-r-e i've been on it for quite a while is is it a hard one no i'm just (laughs) reading it slowly Oh, okay. Oh, you're reading? Yes, of course. <laughs> well, here, can, can I tell you one really fascinating uh, kind of extension off this idea? I um, went to a conference years ago and uh, listened to a talk where um, he was really very strongly pushing the idea um, of children copying the scriptures by hand, copying the Bible by hand. Okay. I was so persuaded by this talk. I came home and thought, you know, I'm I'm so persuaded, but I'm going to actually try this myself on me. So I started one night just copying the book of John. And I'll tell you, when you're copying, it is ultra slow reading because, you know, you read a sentence, you copy a few words, you check and be sure what you copied is the same as what you read. And, you know, if you're if you're trying to copy neatly, you're really lucky to get you know, 300, 400 words in 20 minutes. I mean, it is mm-hmm. it is slow motion contemplation. And what I noticed is in reading, in reading and writing it again and again so slowly, things came into focus. It was a bit like a it was a bit like watching a movie in slow motion. You know, where where they slow down the fight scene and the fist punches into the face and you see the face you know, deform and the sweat flies off in the air. And you see all these little details that you would never have noticed if it had been in regular motion. Well, that was my experience in copying the book of John. I was seeing, imagining details that I never would have imagined because, you know, things kind of whip by. Well, there's that walking on the water again. Well, there's that miracle at Canaan, you know. (laughs) Right. And... So um, I think that when we slow down, not only do we build the language database better, we actually allow for greater imagination. We allow for more detailed imagination. And the great books, you know, like the Tolkien or Dickens that have these kind of extended descriptions, 
are so much better at helping to build the imaginative faculty than some of this modern juvenile literature that just whips through the plot. Right. Yeah, I've noticed that even with my kids when I'm when I'm assigning them something to memorize a poem or a psalm or something, if they handwrite it out, it's amazing how much quicker the task of memorizing it is. And I think it's fairly enjoyable, especially if you write something out really neatly. It's kind of it's contemplative, and then you have this beautiful, um, you know, written narration of what you've you've read, and that's really neat. Yeah. Well, I asked the readers at my blog if they had any specific questions for you, and are you up to tackling a few of those? Oh, I love questions. Okay, excellent. Well, the first one comes from Ellen, and she says, My son is almost 13, and he can read, but he much prefers me reading aloud to him. His reading independently is slower, and he has a harder time focusing. Am I making it worse by continuing to read to him aloud? That is a great question, and it is Ellen is not alone in having that question. It's probably one that I answer every week at a convention multiple times. <laughs> and um, one thing I like to share with people is kind of the story of my son, because he literally couldn't read anything out loud. I, or, or, I'm sorry, at all, independently. He couldn't read anything until he was almost 12 years old. Oh wow! Okay. Um, he, you know, he he couldn't read. I mean, you know, he could stand out words like mom and cat when he was nine and ten. But you give him a word like, you know, bed, and he just flip out. Beg, deg, bad, blub, blub. Mm-hmm. I can't. Know. That's that's how my eight year old son is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so you know, it's not like I don't know how to teach someone to read. It's just that <laughs> you know, neurologically, he was just not going to do it, no matter how hard you you know you try to drive the phonics into his brain. He's just not ready. And as I said earlier, uh, you know, I know any number of teenagers, uh, of men who did not read a book until they were teenagers. Mark Hamby, big speaker on the homeschool circuit. Do you know Mark? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar. He didn't mm-hmm. read a book until he was 20 years old. Really? I did not know that. Yeah, now he owns a publishing company. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so, but Fair enough. Here, here's the really interesting thing. Because my son couldn't read and certainly couldn't read at grade level until he was about 15 or 16, he got way more into his ear than any of his, his siblings, any of the girls. And hmm. the, the truth of it is, he's actually the most eloquent writer of any of the kids at his age because he's got the most extensive database of reliably correct and sophisticated language patterns because he never read drivel. He right. only listened to good and great literature growing up. But you can't up. listen to drivel. And, I mean, you can't. You can try, and it's just painful, well, painfully obvious how, you know, just... Yeah, I, tr- I tried <laughs> once to listen to uh, True Confession just because I was curious, you know, what it was. I tried to listen to Twilight, but it was just so <laughs> awful. You know, I gave up yeah. after about five minutes. You know, why would I torture myself with this ho- right. horrible language? When there's so much other great out there. So what it's kind of like, here's, here's my analogy. Have you heard that thing about how they train Secret Service to detect, to detect counterfeit? Is no. they, let, they let them only see real bills. And they handle only real bills. And so then when they find the counterfeit bill, they detect that it's not real. If, oh, interesting. If children only hear good literature then they will be sensitized to that. They will have an appreciation for the reality. Whereas uh, what we do, and and Andrew Kern points this out very boldly and and clearly when he says, you know, we stupefy kids when we put them in first grade. They're intelligent when they're home at five and we're reading them books and they're listening and imagining. And then we set them down and say, here, read this. Max the cat sat. Max the cat Mm -hmm. sat and sat. Max sat. And you're just thinking, ah, I mean, this is that intellectual insult to any human being. And so we we actually start to dumb them down by teaching them to read. Um, So now I'm not saying we don't teach decoding skills and, you know, books with simple phonics are important for that. But if we don't continue to feed them high quality literature 
at the same time, then they become deprived of good language. And then we, right. we exacerbate that by putting them in a world where, you know, they they are getting who knows what from the media, from peers, parents, and, and adults are busy. So <clears throat> I would say to Ellen, um, I think you should be happy that he still loves listening uh, and don't ever stop reading out loud to him. Read everything you need to if it's better comprehension. And, you know, there will be a time, and, it, you know, it may be next year, it may be four years from now, it may be ten years from now, when when he'll, his own decoding skills will come up to his listening skills. And that will probably blow her away. But it certainly doesn't have to happen on on any kind of rushed schedule, unless, of course, you put in a kid in a public school, at which point they're all anxious about, you know, reading levels and comprehension levels. Um, The other thing, I'll tell you, this is, it was so cute, Um, just melted my heart. I have an adult daughter, uh, Genevieve, who's uh, mid-30s right now. I'm not even sure how old she is. But um, she lived at home uh, on and off in her 20s uh, before she was married. Recently, she was married. And we would read out loud, and she, she would love to hear me read out loud, even though she's one of those kids who was reading Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know, back to back ten times through when she was six years old. And she said to me, she said, you know, Dad, when I listen to you read, it's kind of like I'm listening, it's kind of like I'm seeing everything in color. And when oh, I when I read it analogy. myself, it's it's more like black and white. So e- even for kids who do read extremely well and have from a young age, there are I think some real benefits. But the last thing I wanted to say to Ellen is, you know, my son. I think honestly, it was a blessing for him to be such a late reader because he avoided reading any junk. He only got great quality language into his brain, and he became the more eloquent speaker and writer of any of his siblings because of that. So you keep reading out loud as much as you want, and don't worry at all You know, if his, his independent decoding skills are behind. They will catch up eventually, and it really doesn't matter when. Oh, that's very good. That's very inspiring. And, you know, it's funny. For me, my, my first two read they were, my first two daughters read when they were younger and my son is just not not quite there yet and i never feel angst about it until uh until someone sort of from the public school mindset maybe uh, that whole idea of just they need to be reading at a certain level at a certain age starts questioning and then i'll start to kind of wonder what i'm doing wrong but you know he speaks very well and he l- loves to listen to stories and even my oldest daughter who reads voraciously on her own if I offer to read aloud to them, she'll slam her book shut and yes, please. So it's just mm-hmm. that. Yeah. It's really great. Okay. So then another question we have is from Erin and she says, I would love to know Andrew Putua's thoughts on a mid elementary child thinking he is getting too old to be read to. We have always read aloud as a large part of school and also as a family, but my oldest keeps dropping heavy hints that he thinks he's aging out of reading aloud. Well, um, <clears throat> that you know, there is that desire of you know every eleven-year-old to grow up faster, and that's normal and natural. I think what you know, there's a couple responses. One response is, well, it doesn't matter. I want you in the room. We're reading aloud as a family. It's non-optional. So just you know, play with Legos and listen, and mm-hmm. and we're not going to debate whether this is a good use of your time or not. Um, you know, so you can just make rules and kids that age can live with them. You know, around 14, it's a little harder. <clears throat> Although I did it with a teenager and I said, I'm going to read this book, The Fellowship of the Ring, out loud to everyone in this family. And if you don't sit in the room and listen to me read it to you, you don't get to go see the movie. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and what I found is that kids around a certain age, and of course this can vary, they do start to get a little fidgety. I mean, it's actually harder for a teenager to sit still and listen than it is for a seven-year-old. Oh, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, can they keep their hands busy? You know, can can the student crochet or play with Legos or draw pictures or, good heavens, even work on math homework? 
Um, right. You know, you, you even use a kind of a different part of your brain, I think, to do a lot of the math homework you need to do. And I can listen to an audio book and, and work on, you know, non-language type activities and, and it's, it's enjoyable. So, you know, I think keeping the hands busy will help to minimize the, the feeling of, well, I'm not doing anything right now. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do is, of course, you know, put on audiobooks when you have captive audiences, usually in cars. <laughs> so, you know, you've got your whole family in the car, you know, you put it on an audiobook, and, uh, you know, this is what we're doing. We're listening to it. You, no, you can't put in your iPod and listen to music. We're, we're listening to the audiobook. But, you know, you can also, you know, Erin can also tell her mid-elementary child that I am a 54-year-old adult and I love listening to audiobooks. Um, yes. I, you know, in fact, I was uh, driving to Springfield last week and I found this wonderful book of stories called The Exploits of Brigadier Gerard by Arthur Conan Doyle. And I was sad when I got to my destination because I wanted to keep listening to I love, to I these love audiobooks stories. Like that. <laughs> you know, in fact, I will true confessions here. I am a Lemony Snicket fan. The series of unfortunate events. I mean, that is the yeah. the modern Hansel and Gretel fairy tale done better than anyone else. He's probably one of the pithy, funniest living writers. I, you tell your elementary child that I, a fifty-four year old man, secretly listen. To Lemony Snicket audiobooks. <laughs> um, so you never really outgrow that. But I would guess that, you know, he's kind of saying, hey, you know, I'm getting older, so I better do whatever it takes to get older faster, which is what most kids think about. And if he, you know, if he has friends, you know, and talks about, oh, my mom was reading the story, you know, and he's got public school friends, your mom's reading to you? That's kind of, that's kind of baby. I mean, Right. Our, t- our teacher says we should read everything our own. You know, that kind of conversation with peers can kind of undermine, you know, what's true and what's good and what's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think just, you know, it, some of those approaches, just do it whether they like it or not, convince them that there's value, and then, you know, have opportunities where you all enjoy listening together. And it's not just mom reading, but mom listens too. And then you talk about what you've read. I think, you know, uh, a student deep in their heart knows what they, knows what's good for them. And I think we all know that listening to a, a good story, listening to a, a good book, great book is good for our soul. Yeah. One thought I had when I read that question was that maybe it would help to frame the read aloud time as more of a family event, not something that you're doing necessarily for the student to get, you know, more content into their brain or more literature into their head, but just something the family does to enjoy time together. You know, I know I've, I've heard of couples who read to each other. I think Lee Bortons from classical Conversations says that uh, she and her husband read aloud to each other in the evenings, you know, even when there's no kids around at all. I love the message that sounds that sentence, you know, I think that's, that sounds romantic for one thing, but it's just a great way to connect with each other and with these bigger ideas. So uh, when I talk about reading aloud as being a cornerstone of family culture, that's what I'm kind of thinking of is something that's meant to be enjoyed and relished for its own sake. So maybe if the student thinks of their read aloud time, if you know Aaron's child thinks of reading aloud as something they do as just family culture rather than something that is being done to him as a way to improve him or whatever. Exactly. Maybe that would be helpful. Yeah, exactly. I think that's true. And the other thing is if this child, you know, actually is pretty good reader, um, why not put him on the job of reading part of it out loud to the family? You know? Oh, that's a great idea. Um, one thing we did, uh, if I can tell you, Sarah, this is one of the really nice things we did with the kids, and it worked really well until we got to number six and seven, because number six <laughs> was the dyslexic boy, and number seven was the you know very sharp early reading girl. But before mm-hmm. that, there was always a policy that every day, and one of the older one of the children had to read to a younger child out loud for fifteen minutes. Mm. So, you know, the the 14-year-old would go find the 10-year-old, you know, and read to them for 15 minutes. It was on the checklist. It was one thing you had to do. And then the 10-year-old would go find, you know, the 7-year-old or the 4-year-old 
and read out loud to them. Obviously, probably a simpler book, maybe a picture book. But it was good relationship building. It was good opportunity for everyone to practice their skills of, of elocution, of reading out loud, of doing that well. And it you know, was uh, part of the part of the day's responsibilities and one of the more fun, you know, less taxing of the responsibilities. So it worked really well until, like I said, number six, seven, because I couldn't really say, you know, six year old girl, go read out loud to your nine year old brother. You know, it kind of <laughs> right. kind of broke down at that point. But until then, uh, you know, and, and they usually didn't choose the closest one. They'd usually kind of skip one and go to a younger sibling and, uh, you know, you can start that with, because good heavens, you know, one and a half, two-year-olds love to look at picture books and be read to out of picture books. So that's yeah. an idea for, you know, some of your listeners as well. Very good. And as far as keeping uh, hands busy, I know that we did brainstorm. Uh, I ran the Read Aloud Revival as a series of blog posts on my blog originally before I converted it into this podcast. And in one of those, we brainstormed some things that kids could be doing with their hands. And so I will link that post in the show notes of this podcast so that people can find some ideas for things they can have their bigger kids do to help them still themselves for Read Aloud. My All my older kids, they're 8, 10, and 12, they all need something to do. They, they love read aloud time, but it, they need something to do with their hands to keep them still. So, yep, yep, good. Okay, uh, Amy asks: Should I ask for narrations at the end of read aloud time, or should I use a Socratic method of questioning, or should I just let it be? So, before you tackle that question, let me just give a brief rundown for our, our listeners in case they don't know what narrations or Socratic questioning yeah, is. Yeah, good. Um, so. Narrations are pretty much a telling back, and so you know you'd read a a selection, and then you'd ask your child to tell back everything they can remember, or tell back something specific. You know, tell me back about a certain character or something from what you just read. That's generally what people mean by narration. And then Socratic questioning is this ancient kind of method of asking questions that help you think deeper about the the material you've read, so not yes or true or false, not the kind that you typically see on a reading comprehension worksheet that just asks you what happened, but questions that help you dig into the text a little bit deeper. I'm actually going to be chatting later on this podcast in a future episode with Adam Andrews, who I know you work with. Oh, uh, good, good, yeah. Yeah, from the Center for Lit. And he has, uh, you know, teaching the classics was my introduction to Socratic dialogue. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how to have really effective conversations with our kids about books. So that will be coming up. But um, back to Amy's question. So do you think uh, we should ask for narrations, use the Socratic method, or should we just let it be? What What would you suggest that we do after a read aloud? Um, well, I think it's a false trichotomy. Uh, there's not one that is necessi- necessarily better than the other. I think the, the answer to the question is yes. Y- <laughs> you should do one of those things. Um, mm-hmm. and, and probably judging on the book, you know, on the story, on the, the circumstance. Um, it's certainly good for children to um, do that narration, to relate back what they heard, what they did, what they experienced, what they they you know, can articulate of that, but it is not convenient to do that if you're in a group, um, because if you have more than one child, it's very probable that the other ones will not necessarily appreciate that um, in the same way that you can if you're in a one-on-one situation. So, you know, if it's just you reading to a child, hey, so let's stop for a minute. Tell me what you just heard. You know, I think there's a lot of value, develops speaking skills, develops one of those four language arts, and, uh, you know, it has a lot of value in uh, creating attentiveness and observation power as well, but I don't think it's going to work too well in a group, honestly. Um, Socratic questioning is a little better because you can direct specific questions to specific people, and I'm really delighted you're going to have uh, Adam Andrews on because... Uh, you know, he kind of has worked out this system to help, you know, even parents who didn't grow up with this type of dialogue experience in school. Most of us, probably. Most of us, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, we sit through class, listen to lectures, leave and say, glad that's over, you know. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, how to engage children and not only ask them questions, but teach them how to ask good questions, teach them how to ask you questions, how to teach each other questions. So I think there's value there. 
But then there's also value in let's just keep enjoying the book. You know, let's just go read one more chapter. This is so interesting. And we want to be sure not to do, uh, you know, what, and I love Andrew Kern. He's the one who, who taught me this, this idiom, kill the puppy, right? Yes. <laughs> we, we don't want to be, um, dissecting literature prematurely. We want to just play with it. We want to just live with it. We want to just take it into our soul. And uh, I don't know, have you read John Taylor Gatto's book, The Underground History of American Education? I've read pieces of it, not the whole thing. You, you might like to li- link to your listeners because you, okay. can, you can download this whole book for free now. Um, it's uh, it's uh, johntaylorgatto.com. Uh, okay. G-A-T-T-O. And there's one chapter called Eyeless in Gaza where he talks about how he wanted to teach Melville. He wanted to teach Moby Dick to his eighth grade class in Brooklyn, New York. And he had a, a school edition that had all the right questions and, and all the you know answers to the right questions and the chapter by chapter extracts that that this teacher's edition of Moby Dick actually did more harm than good Mm. because it asked all the right questions and demanded all the right answers but the fact is a book like Moby Dick is a huge thing and and as he put it it preempted any opportunity for a personal you know relationship with the author for a Mm -hmm. personal understanding or a personal interpretation I think if you know if you and your husband and I and my wife and a couple other people all read you know a great book and then came together to talk about it we would discover that each of us found different aspects of it to be maybe even the most significant thing for us. So I think to to just play with the puppy, just let the book seep into your soul and not analyze it prematurely, that, there's a lot of importance in that as well. And so I think, you know, Amy's question is answered by, you know, yes, all of those things are good in their own time under the right circumstances – and uh, there's no formula, you're going to have to decide. <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Uh, I think, do we have time to squeeze in one more question? Sure. I, you know, I can talk for hours, so it's all up to you. <laughs> okay. Well, Kelly wants to know, how should I pick our read-aloud books? Should I choose them to enhance our studies or just choose books that seem interesting? My problem is I always choose books that enhance our studies so we never get to the good modern fiction books that I loved as a child. Well, um, certainly, you know, you want to read books that enhance the studies. I, I think that brings things to life. But, you know, for example, most people remember a lot more from having read or listened to Johnny Tremaine about the Revolutionary War time period than they mm-hmm. would by reading a textbook about the Revolutionary War time period. Why? Because the textbooks give you facts, but there's no narrative, really, to lock it to. Whereas with the story of Johnny Tremaine, you, you start to live the life with Johnny Tremaine. And so you're there, and you're, you're building your imagination and interest. So particularly with historical fiction, I think that's really important. In fact, you ask most of my adult children, you know, where did you learn most of your history? They'll probably say historical fiction. Mm-hmm. But my other advice to Kelly and all parents really is this. Read books that you want to read. Right? Because if you're reading right. a book you really want to be reading, you'll be having a good time with it. You'll be enjoying it. And if you're enjoying it, your kids will be enjoying it. And if you're reading a book that you don't really want to be reading, they will tune into that very quickly and they will probably not enjoy it all that much either. Uh, so, and I would even go so far as to say, you know, if you start in on a book and you're just really not having fun with it, just stop. There's no rule. Yeah, we've done that to. before. It's really hard. I mean, as hard as it is to carve out time anyway, just in our sort of busy culture, if the motivation isn't there, the intrinsic motivation that it's really enjoyable to read aloud, it makes it much harder <laughs> to carve out time to sit and read aloud. So yeah. I found that enjoyment so, element to be really important. And and then what happens is if you're if you're enjoying the book, you'll you'll say, hey, do we have time for another chapter? Yes, I think we do. Let's just mm-hmm. read more. You'll actually you'll get more volume of reading done. If if you're reading books that you also, you know, that you want to read yourself as well. So. Yeah, right. Right. Very good. Well, where can our listeners connect with you online? 
Well, our website, uh, we just recently broke down and, and bought the three-letter domain name so we can look big. It's <laughs> I, IEW.com. Okay. And um, we've got on our website, I, th- I think it's quite intuitive and easy to navigate, but we have um, you know, our help tab, we have our audio downloads tab, um, uh, or help and support it is, and then resources, uh, articles, video, audio. I have a, um, uh, like a two-page article I wrote kind of summarizing the importance of reading out loud and of memorization, which uh, I know you're, you're also quite keen on. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can sign up for our e-newsletter. They can uh, get our, our Magalog. We just uh, sent it out um, in March, yes, and so got it's mine. got some great little articles in there. And uh, if you want to know about events that are happening in our area, you know, be sure we have your, your physical address as well. And then if we come and do some uh, seminars for kids or mini conferences or whatnot, we'll let you know. And um, we're, Great. Uh, and um, I, I will go ahead and put links to all that up in the show notes, too, because of that article, One Myth, Two Truths. That's the one you're talking about, yes, right? Yes, yep, that's the yes, one I mentioned. I'll make sure I link to that because that's a great read. And then um, Nurturing Competent Communicators, I assume, is still available on your site? Yes, that would be in the audio part. And we also great. have a, a search bar, so if you... If you get a little bit lost, uh, the problem is we've got so much on the site now. Sometimes it's a little (laughs) harder to find the things that you immediately want. But you can search for that, Nurturing Competent Communicators, uh, as well. Or maybe you can put the the direct link. Great. And if any of our listeners are going to homeschooling conventions this year, make sure you check the IEW website because you can see where you can possibly get a chance to talk with Andrew or his team. You'll be at several of those, right? I will. Yeah, lots, lots Great. of them. It's, we're hitting the busy season, and <laughs> yes. I don't think I'm coming to Washington again this year. But uh, I know I've been watching. I watch like a hawk to see when you're coming. <laughs> so, but we'll we'll so. hope to meet up again at some point. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. It's been very enlightening and super fun, like I knew it would be. So I hope we can do it again sometime. Well, thank you so much for your time. And we'll look forward to uh, putting this uh, podcast up on our uh, Facebook page and letting a lot of folks know about what you're doing out there, uh, serving the homeschool community with uh, friendly, energetic, informative, informative interviews. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. All righty. God bless you, Sarah. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is the part of the podcast where we'll hear from kids in their own words about the books that have been read aloud to them. Hi, my name is Olivia. I come from Alabama. I am eight years old, almost nine. I want to tell you about my favorite book, Duty and Stink, Mad, 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 Mad Treasure Hunt. This is a very good story. It has one of my favorite books characters in the story, Judy Moody. What I like about it was they won the treasure hunt. The end. Hello, my name is Hans and I am 10 and the fav- and my favorite book that my dad has read to me is The Hobbit. I like The Hobbit because of the many adventures and the voices my dad has for all of the different characters. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited about this new venture. I think it's going to be a ton of fun, and I've got some great plans in store. For today's show notes with links to everything that was discussed, head to readaloudrevival.com and look for episode one. I'd love to know what you thought of today's show, so leave me a comment there. I really want this podcast to be something useful and inspiring for you. I'm wide open to suggestions, so let me know what you think we could do to make this a fabulous podcast. Also, you can pop your email into the form there at readaloudrevival.com, and I'll send you a heads up whenever a new episode is ready. Also, if you enjoyed the show, it would be a huge blessing to me if you rated the podcast in iTunes. You can go to readaloudrevival.com and then click a button there, then I'll, I'll walk you through how to do that. It only takes a minute. It makes a really big difference in getting the word out about the podcast, so I'd appreciate it to anyone who's able to help me out with that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This has been loads of fun. I look forward to many more episodes coming up. Until next time, go build your family culture around books. 
Thank you.